Hello, everyone, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition. Today is June 19th, Juneteenth, the date in 1865 that marked the end of enslavement in Texas, but is also widely observed as a day to mark the liberation of all African Americans. Um, as many of you know, this twice weekly series of our podcast that we kicked off back in March is where we talk with entrepreneurs and other interesting people about how they're figuring out creative ways to navigate the economic crisis and all the other crises and conversations that are happening. I'm in the window next to me here, I think that's right, yeah, is former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick. Um, he, we are taking your questions for Governor Patrick on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube. Governor Patrick, well, I, I don't even know where to begin, but I'll just say something very brief. He is behind an initiative to incubate entrepreneurs from Israel and Palestine to create businesses together. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but for now, Governor Patrick, it's great to see you. I'm welcome. Great to see you. Thank you, Guy. Thanks for having me. Happy um, Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth to you. Yeah. And just a reminder to anyone watching um, on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, you can submit your questions for Governor Patrick um, you know, throughout our conversation. So please do so, and we'll try to get to some of those questions. Um, First of all, how are you? It's it's a sort of a wide open question these days, know, right? Um, how have you how have you been these past few months? Just kind of coping with the the, the pandemic to stay healthy and safe. Uh, how, how have you been doing it? Well, you, so we've been. Uh, my family and I have a, uh, a a place we're blessed to have out in Western Massachusetts, and uh, and we've been out here since the middle of March, and we've been pretty isolated i'd say on the whole and quite careful because my wife diane is a is a cancer survivor so she's in a particularly vulnerable um uh, she's well but she's in that vulnerable uh, group and um and we're careful about who comes and goes and wearing masks and even gloves when we're uh when we're out they send me out to get groceries because i'm the expendable one um but uh <laughs> That's me too in, in our house. Yeah. 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 But, you know, I, we, I think we've been thinking just how incredibly fortunate we are to be able to come to a place like this with our family and, you know, be able to take a walk and still be uh, isolated from uh, uh, or socially distanced from uh, from others. And at the same time, heart sick about um, all the unfinished business in America that um, that the pandemic has exposed, and you know, I this so many of these issues have been on my mind and heart, and have been at the center of my work for a long time. But it's now for every it's on display for the whole country for the folks who you know had managed to look away, and that has been painful. Um, but it's also, I think, a real opportunity. Um, Governor Patrick, one of the reasons why we really want to talk to you today, um, not only because I've interviewed you before in the past and you're just so thoughtful. Um, I, I was before this with this went on, we were talking about a, a story I did with you and all things considered, I think 10 years ago when I hosted the show about your dad, who was a who's famous j jazz musician. Um, you didn't really know him very well. And all these recordings were uncovered and we talked through through those. And it was just such a powerful story. Really one of my favorite segments I've ever done. Um, but you also recently wrote an article um, and you posted on Medium. Um, it's called um, uh, it's called America's Awakening to What It Means to Be Black. Um, if anyone watching hasn't read it, um, we will post that article on our Twitter pay, uh, handle and our Facebook account. It's, it's easy to find um, on Medium. Well worth reading. I mean, I just want to quote a couple of things that you you wrote in that piece. Um, we hear from the famous and the accomplished how their fame and accomplishment has not immunized them from the presumption of dangerousness by police. I gave up going to baseball or football games long ago because I got tired of having to overhear drunken fans at Fenway Park or Gillette Stadium shout out epithets at players on the field. Um, you write, like every other black trial lawyer, I know you were a trial lawyer, I've been mistaken for a defendant awaiting trial and directed elsewhere when I came to sit with other attorneys near the bench. The cut of my suit or the quality of my briefcase never mattered. Um, this is, I mean, I, I read your, your your memoir. This is one of the most personal things I've ever seen you write. Um, tell me about, about writing it. Well, you know, we, we've, we've all been, um, or at least so many of my friends have been, uh, and I have been uh, contacted by our by our friends, white and black and every other kind, asking how we're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, in the wake of the 
of the videotaped killing of George Floyd um, and of the shooting of, uh, of Ahmaud Arbery uh, and that astonishing Central Park video uh, of Amy Cooper reacting to being told to leash her dog. <laughs> um, and, um, and we've been exchanging with each other, um, some of my black friends and I, um, some of the things that we have written and some of the things that we have read that um, really are a longer form, a more complete form uh, of, of answer to the question, how are you doing? Because it's not simple. We're not doing well. Um, we're doing, uh, you know, it's in, in a way, especially for those who have been as blessed as I um, and some of my professional uh, friends to have lived very much the American dream, we are reminded um, that that dream has been elusive for so many other uh, young men and women just as creative, just as ambitious um, because of structural barriers that only a few of us have uh, been able to overcome. We're reminded of what my what my wife calls the indignities du jour. You know, it's the sort of thing we talk about all over the dinner table, but yeah. uh, but that you find in order to function in the larger world, you have to tamp down and even, you know, try to put out of your mind. I hadn't remembered Guy until um, a young, then young, now less so, uh, aide of mine in the campaign and in the, in the governor's office, uh, reminded me that in the uh, early days of being governor, maybe in the early months of being governor, I was uh, in the front seat of a black sedan official car in the passenger seat being driven by a black state trooper in plain clothes. And we were pulled over by a marked uh, uh, state trooper car. Um, you know, just why? Um, wow. And what was even more ironic is we had lights on our car as well. And when we put them on, <laughs> he still wouldn't back off. Uh, hmm. And so it, I gave the order to the, to the driver to pull over. Um, and he just, I think he was new. He just couldn't process that there was a, uh, you know, a trooper who identified himself as a trooper who was black and plain clothes and a governor who identified himself as the governor in a suit sitting in the front, in the front seat. You know, I hadn't, the, the fact that it happened in some ways is less significant um, in the point I'm making than the fact that I had forgotten it. Yeah. Because you push this stuff down um, so you can keep going and do what you, uh, what you need to do. Um, if you're watching on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, we're taking your questions for Governor Deval Patrick, former governor of Massachusetts, um, also an entrepreneur and a business leader. We'll talk a little bit about that um, in a bit. You know, I, I wonder whether, um, I, I imagine that, because I think there was a line in that article you wrote about sort of, you know, everyone I know who is in my situation or in, in, a, in a sort of a, a different situation, but who is African-American Amer in America suppresses rage all the time just to function, just to get through the day. Um, and I imagine that watching these mass demonstrations and these conversations about racial injustice and also a racial reawakening, um, I don't know, just I, reading that article, it, it seemed like it kind of gave expression, like it, it sort of, the, the kind of the words in that article just flowed out of you. Uh, well, there was more, <laughs> I cut it, I cut it down, but you know, it's, it, I, I, I share the rage. I also, I also share the optimism. Um, you know, this, this country has been good to me, um, but I have never been, um, I've never forgotten it has not been good to everyone, and I think that there have been all kinds of situations that I and others are are uh, recalling where the you know. And by the way, none of my experience amounts to what happened to George Floyd. I'm not trying to equate them. I'm talking about the through line of devaluing black life, yeah, black talent, black ambition. Um, uh, you, you know, that, that, that is, uh, is an experience, uh, for all of us and that we are so 
often um, in interactions with, uh, with our white colleagues and friends or with others, um, reluctant to bring up because we don't want to have to, number one, um, do the additional work of just making them feel comfortable before yeah. we bring them up. Um, and secondly, having to persuade them that it happened. Yeah. Um, you know, there is a kind of a curse, uh, I describe it to being black, which is that you're always asking yourself in this country whether the thing that went sideways in your life was on account of race. It isn't always, but sometimes it is. Yeah. And it's not, uh, and the way you know isn't um, entirely to do with whether it, you know, is uh, peppered with the N word. Right. Um, and if you look at the you look at the stats, uh, you can see there's an awful lot of what we've been doing the, in this country and and how and whom we've been leaving behind that has its that is as the result of policies or practices that have their roots in racially motivated uh, decisions. Yeah, you you have worked um, for major in, in major corporate environments, Coca Cola, Texaco, investment mm -hmm. firms. And now I'm, I'm sure you've, you're noticing a lot of big companies, Fortune 500 companies are speaking up about their support for racial justice, posting Black Lives Matter. Um, what, do you, what do you make of it? I mean, do you think it's authentic? I mean, do you think businesses will, will or could actually lead the way towards a more equitable and, and just country or, or, is, it, or is, it a, is it an illusion? Well, so I'm gonna say two things. First of all, um, we all have reason to be skeptical um, but it is a it is definitely a step in the right direction because um, frequently businesses stay out of things that are viewed as politically hot, right, uh, or socially uh, uncomfortable. You know, um, do you remember? Uh, I can't remember which company it was. Maybe one of the big box stores that took a position after um, uh, after one of the mass shootings uh, in the last. Couple of oh years. yeah, I think it was Dick Sporting Goods. They 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 withdrew guns, right? I think that that's that, that sounds right. Yeah, and um, uh, and it was viewed at the time as a, a you know, kind of a radical action for a yeah. or at least an unusual action for a corporation to uh, uh, to take because it was. Um, but you know there are ways in which you know I'm, I I guess I'll step back and say I believe that we need to recapture a notion of community in this country, that we have a stake in our neighbors' dreams and struggles as well as our own. The, the yeah. sort of, the way I understood community growing up on the South Side of Chicago, you know, we, I think we may have talked about this, where every, every child was under the jurisdiction of every single adult on the planet. Yeah, right? yeah. You messed up down yeah. the street in front of Ms. Jones, she'd go upside your head as if you were hers, <laughs> right. and then call home, so you got it two times. Right. I think what those adults are trying to teach us is that we we belong to each other. That doesn't absolve anybody of personal responsibility. It doesn't uh, negate the necess uh, necessity for grit and determination and so forth and preparation, but that um, a community does uh, owe something to each other. And I think that is also true uh, of the corporate uh, community. And my work in the corporate uh, community has been to that effect they have been traditionally quite timid yeah you know um uh because they have customers and business relationships across the political um uh, spectrum but it seems to me you know we can move uh a lot more away from uh right and left and in the direction of right and wrong and businesses could do that without mm. jeopardizing their uh uh, their commercial relationships. So I am encouraged by what I have heard, but everybody needs to watch for what these companies do. Yeah. And if I may, um, I know I'm talking too much, Guy, but uh, no, no, please, please. I, I, if I if I may, um, you know, I I uh, uh, when I left uh, my second term as governor, I uh, founded uh, and led an impact investing fund. A uh, fund that was designed to uh, make uh, equity investments in uh, in going concerns, sm uh, small and medium-sized uh, businesses, for both financial return and so measurable social or environmental impact. And I did that at Bain Capital, 
and I was proud to do it, and it's, uh, it's been a terrific success, and it goes on. Um, when, uh, when I saw the first internal statement that Bain Capital put out to its employees after, you know, in the last few weeks after yeah. the George Floyd videotape, it was shared with me by a former um, colleague, it was appropriate and restrained and measured and it you know it was there's nothing wrong with it but it felt negotiated hmm. it felt like what you would right kind of expect um i'm glad there was one no doubt about it about a about 10 days later the firm issued a different statement or a new statement and it talked about some of the things it was going to do hmm. and um interestingly um Hiring and promotion was a part of it, but it's not where it started. It talked about taking the firm's resources and expertise, I think it was $100 million, and investing it alongside coaching in black business development and entrepreneurial growth in the greater Boston area. That's action, hmm. right? It's bringing what the company, what its, what its centerpiece is, what the firm's centerpiece is, it's its, uh, uh, its talent offering and its, uh, its value creation um, to, to, to go right at a um, big, uh, big part of the problem. And it made me quite proud um, to see that. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, the next step from, from corporate America. We're getting um, a bunch of questions through Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, and we're still taking your questions. This is from Allison Biggs. Um, she asks, what, what concrete actions can elected officials at all levels of government take to answer the calls of protesters in cities and towns across the country? Yes. So it's a policy question. It's a tricky, challenging question because I, I think if we had the answers, we would be able to give them. But I mean, let's talk about policy for a moment. Um, how, what, what sort of actionable, measurable things could happen, could, could, you know, could be implemented that could actually have a significant impact very quickly? So, um, I'm going to try to answer that impossible um, question in the time we um, we have. Um, but we can we, we can go over. Don't worry, unless you with, unless you have to run. Well, I would just say with a with a qualifier, I think it's really really important that we not look for quick solutions. I mean, if yeah. they have avail themselves, great. But we got here by decades and decades of bad habits, and we're going to have to commit to undo those habits and get decades uh, and stick to that, sustain that. So we get uh, long-term, uh, we get long-term results. And we're, and I think in some ways it starts with a kind of philosophical question. We got to stop acting as if justice is this limited resource that gets apportioned in ways so that, you know, if you get a little bit more justice, I get a little less. That's not how it works, right? There's a, there is a, there is a notion, um, uh, much of it is instinctive, um, but that has practical implications about how we um, let the values of equality, opportunity, and fair play not be one-offs, but be central to every decision leaders, uh, leaders make. I would start, if I were still in office, by bringing in some of the voices who are out on the street. And many of them are out on the, on the street because they don't feel heard. And yeah. that starts with uh, with black and brown citizens. But, you know, as we were saying before uh, we went live, one of the most exciting things is that the crowds have been growing and they're becoming more, more diverse. Um, if you think about it, the experience of economic fragility uh, and uncertainty of social isolation, of, um, you know, chronic despair, uh, indicated by opioid addiction, for example, the way those issues become issues at election time and then disappear in between. That's been the experience of black people in this country for generations. It's the experience of lots of people in this country today, right? And that's, and so much of that was exposed by the pandemic. So there are opportunities, I think, for system and systemic solutions that speak to and enable justice and prosperity to spread and spread quickly. So um, concrete, if we start with policing, 
Um, we've been asking the police, by the way, on this point, I think it's quite true of teachers as well. We've been asking the police to do a lot more of what used to be done um, in other parts of the community and through other services to communities, mental health services, domestic abuse services and supports. Um, you know, poverty is, is, uh, is sort of the underlying uh, uh, challenge of so many of the communities where policing is excess. Um, but uh, I th when I hear calls to defund the police, what I hear at their most constructive is to rethink the range of services and supports that enable people in community to help themselves and mm. to uh, and to strengthen themselves. Um, and that's going to be, you know, everything from education to some of the uh, specific social services that I'm talking healthcare, right? Yeah. Um, and then alongside that, you know, how you teach de-escalation as a first response yep. um, by police. We could demilitarize um, uh, the police. That's a that's a that's a path we've been on for some while now. That uh, President Obama uh, uh, halted, if not slowed down, and, and President Trump accelerated. So those are a couple of things. You move on up. Um, you know, we talked. To, I mentioned healthcare briefly. We've we've um, had a lot of conversation about how to move to universal um, uh, care, and there are a lot of great ideas about how to that. We ought to get on with that. Um, and, uh, and we want to deal with uh, with the need for affordable housing. And mm. uh, I mean, you know, I'm talking as if these are things unique to black people. But it's back to my point. More and more Americans everywhere are struggling with the very same kinds of limitations on their ability to reach for the American dream. Which I think speaks to this idea that when you when you begin to really reckon with racial injustice, actually, it benefits everyone. Yes, from a program point of view. Um, but, you know, this the other thing that's happening right now is we're having a lot of conversations that are making some of our uh, friends and colleagues and uh, fellow members of our community uncomfortable. And we're going to have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable for a right. little while. Right. right. We just have to have those conversations. By the way, that's what, you know, folks like me have had to learn. Right. Um, how to manage being uncomfortable. Um, and frankly, I mean, and I would say fortunately, I'm curious about people. I'm interested in people. I have, uh, I have learned through lots and lots of trial and error um, to open my heart and leave it open. And, and I have discovered, uh, you know, alongside some occasional heartbreak, um, that there are some remarkable, deep, intimate, loving and meaningful relationships that I've built across all kinds of uh, all kinds of differences. And I think those friends feel that way about me uh, as uh, as well. But you had to be uncomfortable. Yeah. You had to take a chance on that. You know what I'm saying? And I think we have to take a chance um, on uh, on our uh, uh, on crossing the race line, as it were, uh, if we're going to get to a place of better understanding. I want to um, go back to something you talked about with um, with you, you mentioned Bain and their initiative to support black entrepreneurs and, and ventures. Um, as you know, I mean, entrepreneurship overall in the United States has seen has been declining since the 1980s and really declining um, among black entrepreneurs. There were more black insurance insurance companies, black owned banks in the 80s than there are today. Right. Um, is there, I mean, it's, it's a tricky question to ask because we're in the midst of a, a, an economic crisis, but is there, in a sense, is this a moment um, or an opportunity to actually revive and revitalize black entrepreneurship? Oh, in Lord, I hope so. Um, and, uh, you know, again, in the, uh, in the confluence department, I think entrepreneurship is one of the ways that we're going to save um, the economy generally, um, and I think it's a terrific way to start to build generational wealth and create opportunity um, among Black people. Um, but you know, usually, at least in my experience, guy, when this conversation comes up, we get to uh, 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 access to capital. Yeah, 
and the conversation is really about working capital, about loans, and not about equity. And that's different, as you know, yeah. right? Um, and the, I, I would tell you, even in, in my fund, when we were looking to invest alongside uh, black entrepreneurs, there was um, unease sometimes and unfamiliarity often with the idea of having an equity partner come in and, uh, and work alongside you. Um, uh, and I understand that, but, um, you know, some of that is exposure and training and, uh, and coaching. And that, that's why I think that part of what Bain Capital is doing, and I think there are going to be others who do it, is so important. It's not just money. It's, uh, it's, it's exposure. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and coaching. And I'm encouraged about, uh, uh, about that. And I think we could see some of that from uh, state and local and, and maybe even the federal government as well. Um, I have got so many questions for you. Um, you've got a hello, uh, hello from Chris Hagenbush's daughter. Sarah oh my. She's saying hello to you. Hello. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I want, before we, we let you go, I do have to ask you about two things um, that are really important. First, the Together Fund. This is a, um, a political action committee that you launched. And I think in your, in your video on the site, um, you quoted your grandma, who's also quoted in your memoir, because I remember this line. And she described your family when you were a kid. She would say, you know, um, uh, we're broke, not poor, because being broke is temporary. And um, and I wonder what. So first of all, tell us about about the Together Fund. So this is a platform we've set up so that I can uh, I can help uh, candidates who are running in this cycle and the next couple, the Biden campaign to be sure, uh, some candidates for the Senate and House, uh, Democratic candidates who are running uh, in places where Democrats have not competed successfully or at all for some while. Um, but uh, I would say central to it all is elevating this notion of uh, some of these values of generational responsibility, of servant leadership, of uh, uh, making progress by uh, building community and understanding uh, uh, and making decisions around the notion that we should turn to each other rather than on each other. And I think that, um, you know, I think of myself as a, as a values-based leader. I think values-based leader are, leaders can uh, trans, I'm a proud Democrat, but can transcend party. Uh, and I think we could use some transcending of parties in order to uh, heal the country and get on to the work of spreading uh, justice and prosperity everywhere. So um, I'm giving that um, nearly all my time through this year. And then as much as I, my time as I can after this year, when I, I need to, uh, you know, get back to a uh, get back to work as well. And and on top of all this work, you're also involved with something called Our Generation Speaks, where yeah. you bring together Israeli and Palestinian entrepreneurs, I guess, to Boston to have them That's kind right. of incubate um, businesses together. Presumably, it won't won't be able to happen this summer. But um, can you can you tell us a little bit more about that program? Yeah. So it, this is a this is the bra brainchild of a uh, just a gifted uh, young man who was an Israeli soldier um, doing his college work, I think at the time, um, at, um, uh, at, uh, in Boston. And um, he, um, I met him in my last year in office. I had done two trade missions to Israel and, and, uh, and we'd formed some really important um, cultural and social and economic uh, partnerships in that time, explosive uh, job creation and, and wealth creation. And um, he had this idea, he said, uh, of trying to work alongside, he'd been raised in a very con conservative uh, village um, uh, in Israel, never really had any exposure to Palestinians, unlike the generation before, by the way, but that's a whole other conversation, um, until he was uh, charged with uh, surveillance of some of the uh, West Bank um, activities. And he said the more he watched what was going on, the more it seemed like they were trying to make a way for themselves and their families, just like he'd grown up. And he said, you know, what, they, what, it, what was missing in the region, his words, was an infrastructure of hope. And he came up with this idea of bringing young entrepreneurs, Israeli and, uh, and Palestinian, to Boston to work together in the summer 
on their ideas, kind of winnowing them down to a few cross-cultural teams, and then taking those businesses back to the region and working them together so they would uh, build peace through wealth, basically, uh, through jobs. And it was a wonderful idea, and I um, uh, helped him get it stood up, and we've had a number of classes uh, come. We took the, the steering committee over to the region a few years ago before I left to um, to visit uh, the alumni, the couple of classes that were there. And to tell you the truth, Guy, we came away wondering whether the, the, the value we were creating was the commercial or the relationships. Mm. Um, and the relationships were so deep and genuine and lasting. Um, and I think there'll be some good that comes from that that we can't even begin to imagine today. Wow. Um, all right, before we let you go, a couple quick questions here from um, our, our viewers. Allison Biggs um, writes, your, your medium piece is beautiful. Um, Thank you. And she, she asks, are there other pieces of art or media that inspire or sustain you that, that you, you'd like more people to read or hear or see? Wow. Well, um, you know, <laughs> this may, this will surprise some of you, but uh, I'm a great admirer of Winston Churchill. Um, and there's some amazing pieces, a recent book actually uh, out that I think Eric Larson uh, wrote, but I got acquainted with him through uh, the works of William Manchester. And um, he was an, uh, an unlikely leader in many respects without giving away all of his story, a deeply flawed person. Yes. Um, deeply flawed in lots of uh, ways, um, but who um, had an, a, uh, an openness to what ordinary people were experiencing um, and, and how to engage them so that they could surmount incredible uh, challenges and, um, and expect more of themselves as well as of their leadership. And I've always admired his model uh, of leadership. So I go back to, I think I've read just about everything that's ever been written wow. about him. Um, I go back to him over and over again, as I do to Lincoln, who I think also in crisis yeah. uh, grew and knew he was growing and evolving and, um, and stayed humble enough to be able to do so, which I, I think has always been a lesson um, uh, for me. And then there, you know, there are poems and paintings I love uh, yeah. as well. Um, this is a question that several people have, a version of this question, several people have, have asked, including Claire Mur Murashima. Hello, Claire. It's a loyal viewer to our, our live streams. Um, do you, I mean, do it's you think, hard. do you think this moment, Governor, is different? I mean, um, because it seems like it is. It seems like there is a mass movement in this country now that is 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 speaking loud and clear, um, and that I, people are are hearing that. I hope so. You know, we have a famously short attention span in America. You know, who I think understands that better than anybody is is Donald Trump. Yeah. You know, we we tend to turn to the next flashy and shiny outrage and forget what it is we were just um, focused on. I am feeling so grateful to the marchers um, who have stayed out and on the streets, overwhelmingly peaceful for as long as they have, and, and who are insisting on more than, um, you know, kind and sympathetic comments, but are more and more coalescing around an action plan Mm. And it's my hope that that action plan is um, uh, is practical and adaptable um, with respect to uh, policing and is not ultimately limited to policing because, as I mentioned earlier, this through line of, um, of, of uh, the un, um, you know, the unmet um, uh, cry for, the fullness of uh, humanity and uh, and citizenship among uh, among Black people. And that's just that is in that list of unfinished business 
uh, that the country has. And so I, I'm just incredibly grateful for them. And I'm grateful for the many, many others who have unrest in their heart, um, but can't be out on the, uh, on the streets and are expressing themselves in ways that we see uh, for uh, that, that, you know, we got to start paying attention to justice again. Yeah. Governor Deval Patrick, thank you so much. Thank you, Guy. Really so glad great. to be with you. So great having you. Um, before you go, I just wanted to say hello to a couple of people watching. I won't get to everybody. China Richardson in Toronto. Thanks for watching. I'm Stacy Ulrich in Kansas. Mary Eileen in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. We're back here um, next Tuesday at noon Eastern time to talk with Bill Creelman, founder and CEO of Spindrift Beverage Company, a Massachusetts-based company, actually. Indeed. Um, they have had some real challenges over the past few months, and we'll ask Bill what he's learned um, about consumer demand, about leadership, supply chain. It's really going to be really interesting. In case you missed any of my conversation with Governor Patrick um, or any of our other live conversations, we now have I don't know, 30 of them or something, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash how I built this or the NPR YouTube channel. We also post excerpts of excerpts of these on our podcast, the How I Built This podcast. And speaking of which, we'll have a brand new episode coming out on Monday, Jamie Siminoff, founder of Ring. Um, so check that out. Governor Patrick, thank you again. Thanks everybody for watching and um, we'll see you here on Tuesday. Be well.